Okay, so we're going to do the same thing that we did yesterday with the disk. But this time we're going to make it a little bit larger. Um, so your first bead that's going to be on the mandrel with your nice holes. This time I'm going to use a mandrel that's a little bit thicker. So I'm going to use a quarter inch mandrel, which is about a six millimeter. And so by doing that, I'm just going to make my bead base a little bit larger. And then I'm going to keep on adding glass on top of it in order to make it into a disc shape. And remember to think about it in two halves. So as I heat one side, I'm going this side. <clears throat> so as I heat one side of the bead and get this really hot, I'm going to leave this side cold. Now there's one thing that's going to be different about this bead than yesterday, because this one's going to be larger. I'm going to add layers of color. Okay, so. The beginning part of the bead, here's the hole. The first layer, I'm going to do an ivory. And then after that, I'm going to put a transparent on it and layer a transparent over it. Then I'm going to put the dots on all the way around. And I'll put a bunch of different dots on and then, you know, make the layers. And then eventually rake them to the center of the hole. So I'll show you that thin raking and picking. The tricky part about this is that I like to use the ivory in the center only because I like the look of it. But when you're starting out, if you start with ivory on the center and a transparent over the top of it, then the ivory is really soft and the transparent is really stiff. So it makes it really hard to keep that disc straight because you've got the juicy part on the inside and the stiff part on the outside. So I'd recommend like if you're starting out and it's a little tricky for you to get this disc shape to maybe start with a stiffer color on the inside and a softer color on the outside. So I'm doing the inverse, which is more difficult, but I like the effect of it. So let me jump on the torch, show you. <clears throat> So I'm going to use the, um, <clears throat> the pick that we used yesterday, the stainless steel rod, and I'm going to file this one to a point because I want to make sure that it's really nice and sharp <clears throat> before I use it. Make sure there's no glass on there. <clears throat> so now I have a nice fine point. So I'm just using a regular file to do that. When I first started doing this, I'd use a, um, a pin, you know, those T-pins that you use for quilting? <laughs> but they were too small, so I had to use something bigger. All right, so I've got my pick. <clears throat> and then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get some glass and make it a little bit bigger. So I have a little bit more to work with. So this is a nice trick when you want to build up a bead faster and have more glass. So you have to watch out for this because that joint right there can sometimes break. So after I make these, I usually put them into the kiln to keep them warm. And this is going to be the transparent. So I'm going to prepare this in advance. Is it too long to, to make those in advance and then 
and the milk and loaf were mine? I don't know if it would make any difference to make them in advance um, and then anneal them overnight. You know, it, it's a good idea. Um, and then you'd already have them. I, you know, I, I'm never thinking that far in advance, so I'm just doing it as I go. Um, but yeah, you could, but there's such a difference between the thickness of here and the thinness of here. I still wonder if by the time you got there that it might crack. Um, so I think that the surest bet is just to pop them into the kiln and use them as you go. <clears throat> so there's my quarter inch rod. So what you might want to do is if you've never used the quarter inch rod before, we have some of them here that you can dip and we can work with them today um, and do some tests on them just like we did the other day with simple wraps. Do some tests to see how your wrapping goes to feel comfortable with that. So I think the only advantage to folding over the glass, I call it a tuning fork, just because I think that's what it looks like. The only advantage to it is just to work a little bit quick, more quickly. But I can do this you know, fine with a regular rod. Does that make sense to everybody? And there's something nice about having the thicker mandrel. It makes it a little, it feel a little bit maybe awkward at first in your fingers, but then afterwards you can get a bigger disc more quickly. One more wrap. How big do you want to do this? Really big? <laughs> Why not, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, practice rolling those. Um, <clears throat> They're a little heavier. They're, you know, if I'm if I'm doing this at home and I need to make some beads that are larger with these big mandrels, then I try to uh, space out the work, you know, so for the month, I'll make sure that I don't make more than maybe two of them a day. Because if I made them all day, then I would really start to blow out my hand, my thumb would start to hurt, so I want to be a little bit careful about the weight. Okay, one more wrap and then we'll put the transparent on. Mm -hmm. 
So if you're going to lay down this rod <coughs> and then work with it later, put it into a kiln because if it gets cold and then you pick it up and put it back into the flame, it's going to crack. So make sure you make a really nice base before you put the next layer on, especially when they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Don't wait until the end to do the marvering. You know, make sure you build it up and make it nice each step of the way. So I'm happy with this. I'm going to put my next layer on. I'm going to put the ivory back in the kiln just in case I need it later. And sometimes you'll get rods that have uh, air bubbles all the way through them. And they'll crack every time you put them into the kiln. So it's nice to put those tips. I mean, they'll crack every time you put them into the flame. So it's nice to put those tips into the kiln. OK, you ready for a good wrap? So just like yesterday, with the smaller beads, you put the glass on and lift and stretch it around the mandrel. It's the exact same thing. We're going to lift and stretch it around the bead. Okay. Here we go. And now, <clears throat> what I'm trying to do is heat up just the transparent and to keep that ivory core hard and have it not move. So make sure that when you're heating this, you're heating up just that outside ridge. Try not to heat up your inside that much. Does that make sense? You don't want it to all flop around like a potato chip. If it starts to get soft on you, then just wait. Like right now, it's starting to move a little bit on the mandrel, it's starting to shift a little bit like this. So I'm going to wait a little bit, let that cool. Need to have another piece of this. Does anybody have the um, snips, the um, glass cutters? Yeah. Thank you. Can you just snip that off for me? Yep, right there. Perfect. Thanks. <clears throat> so now I'm going to take this littler rod. I'm going to fill in the places that need a little extra glass to make it nice and round.
just put the pink into the kiln because the pink often has little air bubbles in it. And I'm going to put some pink dots on here, and I don't want the, the pink to crack on me. So I just pop that into the kiln. I don't know why it's always that color. Okay, nice and round. When I'm at home alone, <laughs> I take forever <laughs> on this stage. And sometimes I'll do different colors on there. Like I'll do a, a, a wrap of another opaque before I put the transparent on. doesn't get so hot. I mean, I want it to be hot because if it gets too cold, then it will contract and um, the bead will break off the mandrel. Um, but it doesn't get so hot that it transfers up to my hand. I, I don't pay attention to the mandrel. I just make sure that the bead stays hot. When I'm working on a, a bead that has a really large mandrel, um, the ones that are about you know, getting to half an inch thick, you know, the size of my thumb, then you have to pay attention to keeping that warm. Because if that starts to contract, then your bead will fall off the mandrel. All right, let's put dots on this. Right? <laughs> what else would we do? <laughs> okay, so now what do I do? Turn down the flame. Oh, I am happy with that placement, man. <laughs> that makes me feel good. Um, so if they're a little bit off, then what I like to do is get in there with a knife and move them around a little bit. I also just like to move them because sometimes I like to stretch them into ovals just to change the shape of the dot. So it's like spreading butter. You get the dot really hot <clears throat> and then take it out of the flame. You want to see? See how it's stretching? Yeah. yeah. And you can stretch them a lot. When the glass gets stuck on the tool? You can stretch the dot really, really long. I mean, if you, need to, if you want it to go longer and you don't feel like you have enough glass, you can just put more glass on the top of that dot and start stretching it again if you don't feel like you have enough. Like, I'll do that now. I'll stretch this and then I'll add a little bit more glass and stretch it some more. I like a, real, a blade with a really thin, a knife with a really thin blade because I like um, the knife to stick just a little bit to the glass so that it will stretch and pull. So now I'm going to add a little bit more <clears throat> so I can pull them a little bit more.
I'm double dotting the big dot. I'm putting um, one on each end, yep, in order to stretch it a little bit further. <clears throat> then I'll go in there with a the knife. I have a little bit more material to push it. You can push them so they, you know, touch each other almost. How much do you have to, uh, to think about moving the glass in toward the mound head? Do you have to think out so far on the rim? You know, I'm not, cool off I, I guess it does. Um, you know, the, the the bead is a disc shape, so there's a not a lot of um, material on it to get cold. It's pretty thin, so just because I have the heat up here, it transfers through the bead pretty quickly. So I really don't pay attention to heating up the bead, the core of the bead, when I'm doing this. There's enough flame that is going around that disc to keep it warm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's nice, you have one less thing to worry about. Okay, so look at those, those are nice little <coughs> discs. They look like Tic Tacs. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna put some more color on there. Sometimes that red will slide a little bit on the pink, so I'm just pushing it back into shape so it stays centered. I went a little fast putting it on since they slid. If you go slowly, it may pretty much stay where you want. To be. Now you know the trick of the knife. Okay. More dots. Start putting them on the side. Now it doesn't really matter um, when you put those on. You know, when I'm doing this, every bead's a little bit different. So depending if I'm putting on more layers along the top, 
Like right now, I'm going to put another layer on the top. Oh, well, maybe I'll do the other side. Let me do the other side first. <clears throat> I'll do the other side in a, another color. Let's see, green. No, I'll do it in white. I'll just cap, I'll cap it with another color afterwards. <clears throat> maybe I should do pink. Let's do pink. I often do different colors on both sides. I love that. <clears throat> I started doing that because you know the necklaces I make with all these discs? If I have a necklace that has 12 beads in it, if I have them different on both sides, I have a choice of 24 instead of a choice of 12. So it started like that. And then after, if I didn't use it in a piece of jewelry, you know, I'd pick which side I liked better. I could sell the individual bead and at first, I was a little bit apologetic about it. And uh, I realized that people were really actually happy to have a bead that had two different sides. Because then they could wear it either way, right? So, you know, that way when I'm making it, I can, I can um, <coughs> make one side kind of a color that I'm sure is going to work. And then the other side I can risk and maybe try to do a color that I'm not so sure if it's going to work. And uh, it gives me a chance to experiment. If it works out, great. And if it doesn't, then um, if I like the other side, I'll just grind it, grind it off. Okay. <clears throat> not a big difference between the pink and the white, but there's a pink on one side and a white on the other side. But sometimes those little differences are a big deal. OK, so I'm going to melt that in a little bit so I know where they're going to be. They're not going to move on me. And now I'm going to go back over the top. So it's just building on all the information that we've had so far, okay? It's the dots, it's that placement, keeping it hot, melting it in slowly. All right, so now color on the sides. Hmm. Let's do... Let's do green. Green and pink. So turn the flame down. So I'm just putting the transparent green right over that white. And I'm trying to trap all of that white with the green. I'm trying to grab the whole thing. That's one side. Now I'll do another color on the other side for fun. And if I can find my orange. I love orange. Let's do orange on the other side. <laughs> Unless anybody, does anybody have a piece of cranberry pink? Sim? No? I'll use this orange. I'm just going to tip the bead down Oop, like that. A little bit of 
dirty stuff on the end to get rid of. So now it's the striking orange over that opaque pink. Now what else can we do? Let's put on, let's melt that. <clears throat> We're almost ready to do the picking. A little bit <clears throat> of ivory on the top. Take a little piece of that off. Okay, now, melt this a little bit, and then I'm gonna get ready to do the picking. <clears throat> so the feathering that we did yesterday was very hot and juicy and fast. And now the picking that we're gonna do today is gonna be very cold and slow. We're going to use the same tool, so just a piece of stainless steel, sharpened to a point. Okay, so now all the work is going to be done <coughs> on this side, so if you're sitting on that side and you want to move over to the other side of the room, move over, and then afterwards I'm gonna pick like this so you'll be able to see in front, but I'll be able to show it to you on that side. <clears throat> Don't worry, it doesn't happen um, really fast, it's really slow, <laughs> so you have plenty of time to see it. So I'm gonna heat up each individual piece that I wanna work on one at a time. So I'm gonna heat up one place, and then slowly move it. I'm gonna go back to that. Heat it up again and slowly move it. And I'm gonna take my time and do it several times before it finally moves. Okay. <clears throat> if you do it really slowly, and in stages, and when it's really cold, you'll have a finer point. If you do it when it's really, really hot and juicy, then you're gonna get a little ball at the end of glass, which is fine, you know, it could be a decoration. good question. So when I'm grabbing the dot, it's really your choice. So you can grab, let me get, I'll go really slowly over here. So it depends on what you want to do. Do you want to grab that red or do you want to grab just the pink or do you want to also grab the ivory on the top? That's your choice. So I'm going to get, let's see, <clears throat> I wasn't really thinking about it. Let's see what I do. I'm grabbing just below that red 
rim. And it's starting to move. So I would say experiment with that. I mean, if you want to get really ambitious and put 10 layers on there, you know, maybe you want to grab all 10 layers and pull those. Um, maybe you want to put 10 layers on there, but only grab two layers. That's your choice. And you can see I'm only heating up one side of the bead, and I'm not worrying about the other side. The heat's transferring across because it's such a thin bead. And I haven't had one crack yet. Shh. Don't tell anyone that. I guess the only thing that you would have to worry about is that if you're doing a bead on a larger mandrel, is to really keep your mandrel warm. So if this were a larger bead on a larger mandrel, I'd probably stop and heat it up and do this a lot more often. So it's better to have a hollow, hollow mandrel because it'd be too warm? Or? No, I mean, the hollow mandrels aren't necessarily important. I could be doing this on a solid mandrel. If you do use a hollow mandrel, make sure it's a thick hollow mandrel, not a thin hollow mandrel. Um, the thinner ones lose heat too quickly and you can run into some problems. The thicker ones are um, hold the heat better. So I have both in the studio. I have solid ones and thick hollow ones. So, you know, you can stop anywhere. I'm going to do all of them. If you want to stop and not do all of them, you can create a different kind of pattern. And then when you get down to the end, the, the final little touch that you have, you know, give it a little push. If you push it into the glass, it will make that, that final little point pointier and less blobby. Give it a little push. We have two more to do. So don't worry about it um, taking a long time. You know, just keep your bead warm. Okay, so this will be our last one. There's the pattern. Lovely. Do you want to see it on that side? Yeah. Okay, let me warm it up. So you can leave it with those ridges. You know, some people like the texture on there, or you can melt them in. Later I'm going to melt them in, but first I'm going to just work on the other side. So I'm not going to worry about this side. I'm going to go to the other side. And then, um, what should I do with this side? I think that this side, I'll, I'll rake something different. So instead of grabbing this top piece, I'm just going to grab the, what do we have, orange. And pull the orange down. So I'm going on opposite sides of the bead to do the raking. Can anybody figure out why? It's not so much to keep it balanced as the heat. So that way I can heat up both sides of the bead, and then I'll go to the other side and heat it up. And the other thing is I want to always start to work in a place that's cold. So instead of going all the way around, I would be afraid that that 
It would get hotter and hotter and hotter as I was going around. So I always want to go into a, a spot that's cold. Maybe if I did a different kind of pattern, it would become important to go in a different kind of order. But so far, so good, this works. So now you can see why it's really important to have a sharp tool to grab just that top surface of the glass. I mean, maybe you do a design that has more transparency in it and you might want to dig down deeper and grab more glass. There's that side. <clears throat> now I'm going to melt them in carefully. And we'll put a little decoration on the top. So this is where I really like the graphite instead of a metal. Marver, I really like using the graphite because it slides so beautifully on the glass and it doesn't distort the pattern. Real light touch. I'm going to go melt the other side. So you have to be careful when it's really hot, if you push it too much, you can distort the bead and the hole will look like it's displaced and it won't be in the center of your bead. So this final melting has to be kind of delicate. Don't push it too much. Because the bead's already in a good shape. We're just trying to modify the surface of it to smooth it over. And then when I'm doing this, when I'm marvering with the graphite, I'm really holding my tool really, really lightly in my hands so that when I'm going over the surface of the bead, I can feel it in my fingertips, whether or not it's bumpy. So it's not just what you're seeing in your eyes, but it's also feeling it on your fingers. You know when you're driving on the road, and they make those bumps on the side of the road. So if you go too far to the right, it kind of wakes you up. <laughs> it's the same thing. So I'm working on the right and the left. I'm not going to worry about that top ridge yet until the final end. That's why it's important to start on the smaller discs because, you know, if you can work out the the problems with it 
in the small beads, then when you, you know, spend the time to work on a large one, it won't feel so scary. Okay, and then I'm just pushing down lightly on those high points. I don't want to push too much because I don't want to push my bead <coughs> off the mandrel. I'm going to heat it up just on that top ridge and then look at it and then see if I can push down that ho those high points. I feel if it's smooth, it is. There's a couple little bumps. Hold on, I'll get rid of those. <coughs> All right, so how about blue? I'm going to turn down the flame. So who was <coughs> talking about liking using a big rod instead of a stringer. So this is where I feel like it's really um, advantageous to use a big rod instead of a stringer is because when your bead is really big and hot, like this one is, if you had a stringer, it would melt very easily close to this heat. But I have more time with this rod, because the rod is so thick, to get in there and take the time to make that dot. So it t I feel like it takes the panic away from getting into those tight spaces. And now the other side. Zoop. Let's make the flame small again. Make sure your bead's nice and hot so it doesn't crack. So tiny dots. And then quickly warm up your bead so it doesn't crack. Let's see, what do I have? I have orange on this side. Let's put another dot of a different color. Orange with, ooh, maybe a yellow. Let's use this. No, let's go back to blue. <laughs> I make the decisions like this at home too. I'm like, well, what color should I use? <laughs> okay. It's interesting, I've used the, the same color for all the dots, this turquoise blue, but just the fact that it has a different base on one side than the other is going to make it look drastically different. So it's kind of fun to see how colors vibrate next to each other. And now the top ridge. Okay, the top ridge. Let's use something that has some metals in it for fun. See what happens, right? So, should I do one dot or two dots? That's the question. I'll do two dots.
And this dot up here is um, a double helix color. Their colors are super saturated with metals. So they have some really nice effects. I like them with the ivory. I don't know which one do I have here? Tara? Tara. Okay. Now I'm going to melt them in. So the orange that I used on the, the left side, my left side of the bead, was a striking color. Um, and as I was saying earlier, I don't really worry about whether or not it's going to strike. The, the amount of time that I'm working on the bead and the fact that it's just around the annealing temperature so often, it just sort of strikes on its own. The color becomes really dense. So I'm looking across the surface. You know, when I marble, I marble really close up to my face. Um, and then I'm feeling it again with the tips of my fingers to see if it's really smooth. Because sometimes I just can't see it. So it's, it's a feel. And that is feeling pretty good. And I think we are done. Great. Okay, you want to see it? I'm going to hold it right. I don't know where's the best place to hold it. Can you come in and see? If I hold it like that? I'll flip it over to the other way. Okay. I'm going to heat it up and then I'll flip it on the other side. Ready? That one's hard to see because of the um, orange, but you'll just see it better tomorrow when it comes out of the kiln. All right, so. There you have it. Done. Thank you. Yay.